So Pastor Lawrence, um, before he left, said, uh, prepare a sermon on surrendering to God. Now that's easy in this church because I know that everybody sitting down here this morning, um, you're the real deal. You want to surrender to God. You go out of your way to surrender to God. You wrestle with God to surrender, to be more Christ-like, to walk with the Holy Spirit in a real and dynamic way. And I believe that there is a really important dynamic, a really important key to surrendering to God that we deal with every day, every minute, every hour, we deal with it. And there is a dynamic that the Bible talks about that I believe is the key to surrendering to God. Let's just have a look at Romans 2.14. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law, we're Gentiles, we don't have the Torah, we didn't grow up with the Torah, show that they know His law when they instinctively obey it even without ever having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience, which is the spirit, and thoughts, which is from your soul, which is what Liz was talking about, either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim that the day is coming when God, through Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. And it's that dynamic between God's law, our conscience, and our thoughts that we're going to talk about right after this prayer. Let's pray. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, Lord, we just thank you uh, for the Holy Spirit this morning. We thank you for our worship team. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in the church service so far. Lord, we just pray that you would dissolve the distractions of the week. Lord, I pray for clarity to share this message, Lord, so that we can live in victory and be more Christ-like in Jesus' name. So let's just look at that again. Um, Romans 2.14, Even Gentiles who did not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it. I don't tell you, I don't have to tell you, don't murder someone. I don't have to tell you, don't commit adultery. I don't have to tell you to jump over the neighbor's fence and steal their washing unless it's the right colour and size, there's, some, there's something there. We know instinctively that those things are not correct. We shouldn't do them. And it's universal. Those things in every culture, across time, across the world, all exist without any of it being written down. It's evident everywhere in the world. Wherever there's people, that's how it is. And the easiest way, I think, to explain this is there's three components. There's God's law, there's our conscience, which is part of our spirit, and there's our soul, our, our thoughts, which is part of our soul. So think of it like this. If God's law is the judge, then our conscience that makes us feel guilty when we do something wrong, when we think about doing something wrong, that's like the prosecutor. And then our thoughts because we don't uh, enjoy feeling guilty, we don't like feeling guilty, our thoughts are like our defence lawyer that wants to justify our behaviour. And if that's all you take away, I could probably finish the sermon right there, and um, that would be the takeaway message. So I'm going to add um, some flesh to the bones on that as we go through. I'm starting the timer now. I got those first five minutes free. Thanks for that. Um, or we'll put some meat on the bones there, but that's how this thing works. So when you have a situation where your conscience makes you feel guilty, your thought life kicks in. And it says, I'm either going to submit to God's word, whereby I'm surrendering to God, and I get a soft heart, or I'm going to resist God's word because I'm going to justify myself and therefore, my heart gets that little bit harder. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And this is where it happens every day, in every interaction we have, at work, at home, in our own private thought life. 
Now, it's interesting that when we resist God's word and our heart gets that little bit harder, we think God is hard. Have a look at the uh, unfaithful servant who hid his talent in the ground. What did he say? He said in Matthew 25, he also had received one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. If your heart's hard, you think God's hard. Nobody wants to serve a hard master. Rooting where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. We have to take up our cross daily because this is where the rubber meets the road every day, this dynamic between what God's word said, what our conscience says, and what our thoughts that raise up a standard against it tell us to do. And then we make a decision. We either submit or we resist. If we submit, we're surrendering to God. If we resist, then our heart just becomes that little bit harder and it becomes a little bit harder and it becomes a little bit harder and the process over time continues. So, how did this happen? How did this dynamic even come into being? Well, to save time, I won't read it, but I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. Because the question has to be asked, was Adam surrendered to God? Was Adam surrendered to God? We want to be surrendered to God. Was Adam surrendered to God? I mean, the guy was made by God. He hadn't sinned. He's a unique character. He wasn't um, born. He was created. Was he surrendered? Well, you know the story. He says it was pleasing to the eye. It was uh, good for food and for gaining wisdom. So she had a think about it. She knew God's law. Don't eat from the tree. She said that to the serpent. You can't eat from the tree. But then she had a think about it and said, ah, looks good, good for wisdom, good for food. So her thoughts were now elevated to equal or greater than God's word. And she ate from the fruit. Adam did the same thing. Then an amazing thing happened. They were ashamed. Their conscience kicked in. And they ran and hid. Do innocent people run and hide? No, guilty people do. So this is the dynamic it started. It's part of our fallen Adamic nature. It's what we wrestle against on a daily basis. It's that natural response to want to blame someone else to justify our actions and resist the plain word of God. And that dynamic um, affects us, obviously, even to today. So let's have a look at some of the other uh, big name Bible characters and see how they went with surrendering to God. Look at Noah. Was Noah surrendered to God? I mean, Genesis 6, 22 says, Noah did everything that God asked him to. But then he went to the trouble of um, growing a vineyard and getting drunk and in the midst of a shameful act, uh, curse his hand. How did he reach that point? Was Noah surrendered? Well, yes and no. What about Abraham? Well, again, yes and no. When it comes to Isaac, the guy flying colours, you've got to have faith. Hebrews 11 says he thought, oh, well, God will just resurrect him. I don't know about you mothers, but um, have any of you ever considered murdering your first child? Don't answer that. But you have to have a compelling reason to do that. And you have faith. And that's amazing faith. I don't have that kind of faith. Abraham that, had that kind of faith. But yet, Abraham then lies about Sarah, saying that uh, she was his sister, not once. But twice. So how does a guy who's prepared to sacrifice his own son because of his faith in God then lie about his wife um, being his sister because he was afraid? Same dynamic. What about Elijah? Let's go to Moses because I'm in the water here. What about Moses? Okay, he's delivered. Ten plagues of Egypt. Parts the Red Sea. All of that. He gives himself permission to kill an Egyptian guard. That's quite a contrast. 
What about Elijah? Elijah calls out the false priests of Baal, uh, douses his altar in gallons and gallons of water, calls down fire from heaven, consumes the whole lot, and within 24 hours he's fleeing for his life because he's afraid of Jezebel and lives in a cave. All within 24 hours. Yes and no. If I said this, he was a man after God's own heart, who am I talking about? David, we all know. He didn't build the temple, provided all the resources for it. His title, that we all know, is, is he was a man after God's own heart. Um, Jesus is coming back to re-establish the kingdom of David, to establish the thousand-year reign. Um, uh, commits adultery and murders a husband. How do you give yourself permission to do that? What about Paul? Paul, I thought I'd throw Paul in there because he's really unique. Uh, because, see, he thought he was doing God's work as a Pharisee among Pharisees, killing the Christians. Uh, then he meets Jesus and then actually then builds the body of Christ to what we know it today. And uh, here's a, just a little tidbit because I sat under the teaching of a messianic rabbi in Carnarvon and WA and all places, who would have thought. And um, in their tradition, they say that yes, he was on the road to Damascus, but he wasn't going from Jerusalem to Damascus. He was coming from Damascus to Jerusalem because he was on his way to um, be anointed as the high priest. So if he hadn't been anointed as high priest, he was going to kill all the Christians. That's the point. So Jesus intercepted him on his way to take on the mission of annihilating all the Christians. And then he's the guy who the body of Christ and changes the world forever. What about the disciples? Yes and no again. I mean, they were naughty. I mean, Peter takes six of his mates after they were told, you're going to change the world with the gospel. What they do? They go back fishing. They were, Jesus was angry with them. I know he put them in the and met them on the beach and did all that. Uh, but he was supposed to be preaching on the 50th day of Pentecost. He did. But only because Jesus intervened. Otherwise, they were just going to go, just go back to our normal life. How did that happen? After they walked with the Son of God for three years. That's amazing. It's actually quite common for us to be surrendered to God in some areas, but still resisting Him in others. We know that. And it's just the same with these guys. In some areas of their lives, they were well surrendered. In others, not so much. For you, some people here, giving, tithing, no problem. For others, praying for the sick or whatever the case may be, no problem. But other areas, not so good. So it's quite common. That's that endemic nature that we wrestle with. That's why we have to take out our cross daily. That's why it's the only because we love the Lord that we take on the burden of dealing with these issues in our life. Just want to change gears a little bit and say, is surrendering to God simply a matter of rejecting the culture? To look Christian, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? You're whitewashed too, you look good on the outside, but you're full of death on the inside. I'll take um, Abraham here as an example because I find it interesting with Abraham that uh, when God said, I want you to sacrifice um, Isaac, he didn't say, oh, how do I do that? What's the process? He didn't ask that. He knew exactly what to do. Why is that? Well, if Abraham had stayed in the land of Ur where he came from, sacrificing the first one was normal. Because this is how the dynamic worked. You had to sacrifice your firstborn to your local deity. If you didn't, they don't send the rain. If the rain doesn't come, the crops don't grow, and the whole village starves in one year. It's a very compelling reason to sacrifice your firstborn. That's a summary, of course, but you get the idea. So if Abraham takes Isaac up the hill and then walks back down with him, how's that going to go in the culture? You're going to kill us all, mate. And then in Genesis 17, God gives Abraham the sign of circumcision. Why is that? Well, probably one part of the human body that uh, represents lust in the flesh is probably that one. But part of the reason for that is in pagan cultures, 
Temple prostitution was normal. You had to pay for it. You take a grain offering, and that was part of your worship. So separating from the culture, that was the symbol of saying, we're not doing that. We're not involved in that kind of false worship. But the thing with um, separating from the culture is that you can fake it. I think it's part of it, part of our surrender, but it's really easy to just fake surrender, uh, separating yourself from the culture. It happens on that deeper level in that dynamic between God's word, your conscience, and your own thoughts about how you're going to respond to that situation. Now, God also says that uh, we have the power to overcome. And the Israelites had to overcome many uh, tribes in the promised land. And those tribes, according to your view, uh, represent different things that we need to overcome in our life. Is that surrendering to God? Because I'd say it's pretty hard to surrender to God if you're living with the enemy. And what I mean by that is, for example, the dead Israelites. They were one of the tribes in the promised land. It means feeling downtrodden and unworthy. Something, depending on where you look up this translation, they can give various meanings, but you, you get the idea. The Jebusites mean downtrodden and unworthy. How many people struggle with self-esteem in our society today? I'm not worthy of, you know. I'll settle for this. That's something that we can overcome. The Gergeshites means dwellers of the clay or marsh. They weren't living on the land as farmers and grazing and they weren't fishing in the oceans pulling fresh, fresh fish out. They lived somewhere in between, compromise. A little bit like uh, you need the hot or cold or spit you out. Compromise. How can you be surrendered to God if you're compromising? You've got to overcome that. Canaanite means materialism. Man, I, I, I said um, 30 years ago they're going to kill us with prosperity. It's not going to be debt destroys us, it's going to be prosperity. The materialism is everywhere, isn't it? If that's the affection of your heart, big house, big car, better paying job, uh, then it's going to be difficult to be surrendered to God in that situation. Hittites means fear, I mean fear, fear of death, you all have a basic fear of death, all other fears apparently come from that if you listen to the psychologist. Um, but Jesus says fear not. Because we have the hope of eternal life. What, what death, where does thy sting? Parasites means open walled, unwalled. Our modern day version of that is tolerance. It's going to tolerate everybody and everything no matter what it is. So nothing's really changed throughout history. The things that they battled then, we, we are battling with to, today, um, just a different label. Remember the food of the Israelites had to have scales on it? They couldn't eat uh, anything that uh, filtered you know, like octopus or something like that, had that scales. Uh, Amorites, easy one, pride, rebellion. That's obvious, isn't it? Speaks for itself. These are the things you have to overcome. This is an interesting one. The Hivites means to lie openly. Have you seen anyone on TV lie openly? No political jokes, please. But um, just people just don't tell the truth. They're just disingenuous. Even if you're a scientist uh, talking about the creation of the world, you're just disingenuous. How does life come from non-life? I mean, you know, Cole does such a great job in this area. If you uh, listen to his sermons, have a look on the website. They're fantastic. Uh, but this is what Numbers 14, 9 says. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. That's just all the people I mentioned. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. We have the power to overcome all of these things. That helps us surrender to God, because it's hard to surrender to God if you're living with the enemy. So, let's just go over this again so we make sure the message is clear. Even the Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience, which is part of their spirit, and thought, which is part of their soul, either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. Now, they are indistinguishable. The soul and the spirit are indistinguishable from each other. It's only the word of God that separates uh, soul and spirit. 
We wrestle with God just like Jacob wrestled with the angel of God and they changed his name from Jacob to Israel, which means we who wrestle with God. It is a wrestle. We have that identity nature in us uh, that wants to rise up against the authority of the word of God. And we have that opportunity every time that comes to make a decision whether we're going to submit to God's word and get a soft heart and surrender to God, or whether we're going to resist God's word and get a slightly harder heart against God. They were supposed to work together. It was just simple. The conscience says, that's wrong. You go, oh, yeah, God's word says this, therefore I'm going to do it. But we don't. What causes that? Well, the number one thing, of course, is pride. Pride is the number one thing that at that critical moment, during that dynamic, that we make that decision to either submit or to resist, to have a soft heart or a hard heart. In other words, surrendering to God is guarding your heart. It's the same thing. You can't do this. Nothing more important than a Christian can do then guard your heart. And I believe this is the dynamic that protects your heart. The law, the conscience, and your thoughts. So if you don't like the ruling, you just go your own way. That's what happens to most people, but it has a cumulative effect, and people just drift further and further away from God. No man commits adultery on the first day that he thinks of it. It doesn't work that way. The thought comes in and it gains some ground, then it stops and waits. Then the thought comes in and it gains a little bit more ground, then it stops and waits, if you're not dealing with it. And then, over a period of time, you're that far away from the Word of God that you are able to give yourself permission to commit whatever sin is uh, captivating your attention. Second Corinthians 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What strongholds are we destroying? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion, just like Eve in the garden. Her thoughts that it's good for food, it's pleasing to the eye, but to gain wisdom, that thought was equal or greater to than the authority of the Word of God that says you can't eat from that. That's what we're up against. What are some other ones we're up against? Evolution, transgender. You know, these ideas raise themselves up against the authority of God. That's what we have to have arguments for. That takes knowledge, takes courage to stand up and uh, have a standard against those things. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought, every thought from our soul captive to obey Christ. <coughs> That's the key. Because if we don't take those thoughts captive and submit them to the authority of God's word, then that's when sin enters the soul. So can we rely on the Word of God? Is it powerful enough to sort out this particular dynamic? Can it sort out this issue? 2 Timothy 3 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. So it is true what the Bible says. And to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It tells us what's true so that we can realise what's wrong. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. We can trust in the word of God if we follow it. If we submit to the word and soften our heart on every occasion, you can have faith, you can have trust that that will do you good. It doesn't always look like that at the time. But it will over time. Or even right then and there, you will find that you will walk in blessing, you will walk in surrender because your heart is protected, it's soft, 
and it's towards the Lord. The Lord gives good gifts to His children. So I'm going to end it there. The service has gone on a bit long. And uh, so that's the key message there. The Word of God, our conscience and our thoughts are in that dynamic, day in, day out. And as long as we are submitting our thoughts to be captivated by Christ, by His Word, and keep our heart soft, keep our heart guarded, then we are surrendered to God and we can live in blessing and victory. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Thank you.